Hi and welcome to In The Metal, the online show that takes a deep look in behind the dial and see what's happening, what makes the watches tick in the world of independent watchmaking. Uh, we have been absolutely blessed with the, the standard of the people that we have had on from we started a couple of months ago. And uh, it's hard to imagine that the time has just flown around. So what we're going to do tonight, we have a fantastic guest returning, and we're going to take a look at one of the things that we, we, what we've wanted to do within the metal, which is to take a look at a, a specific aspect of the watchmaker's life. One of the jobs that he has to do, because there are dozens and dozens of different skill sets required to create one masterpiece and we have we're, tonight we're going to take a look at uh the art of restoration because some of these watches time pieces go back hundreds of years we're going to take a close look at a watch tonight that's 130 years old and has been restored by our very special friend more than guest uh, Mr. John McGonagall. Uh, we're also going to have an exclusive tonight as well because John has is about to release his brand new brand. Uh, it's very Irish based. It's as we say it's Irish with a Swiss uh, movement, and uh, it's called Ulan. And we're going to have a a scoop on that one this evening. So, everyone, I uh, would like you to welcome my uh, partner in time, partner in crime, from North Carolina in the United States. He is former Anthrax heavy metal six-string shredder, lead guitarist, 30 million album sales, three Grammy nominations, and today a master watchmaker in his own right, Mr. Dan Spitz. Good evening and welcome. What's up, Johnny, my man? How you doing? <laughs> What's the story, my man? You keeping well? <laughs> I can do all that cool stuff, but I still can't boil a bag of rice, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that decoration behind you? Is that the same as, uh, that was on your guitar? One of your guitars? Uh, that's uh, my uh, that's my my deco. I refinished it to look like Van Halen's guitar. So I, Van I have Halen's guitar, cool yeah. as the vintage Van Halen guitar. Uh, I quested after one of those um, machines for a very long time. Uh, I don't have room in here for what's called an Agathon, which will be my next machine as soon as I get out of here. Um, that that's we, we need to make our own lathe bits um, tooling specialized. Yeah. If we have to do a special, um, especially manufacturing. Every little slot or cut, it doesn't adhere to just being able to purchase a tool. They have to be custom made and custom filed. And uh, this is uh, an old Deckel uh, German machine that was destroyed. And I brought it back to life and I kind of modified it so it would do what, uh, what an Agathon does without water, unfortunately. Uh, but it'll, it'll accomplish all my missions. And it's a, one of, I, I personally think after a watchmaker comes out of school and purchases his first watch, watchmaking lathe, uh, this is an overlooked thing, but I think this should be their second machine that they purchase. Uh, it, it eases their entire life and opens up, you know, the abilities to, to make your own tools, save tons of money and get the job done. So, Fantastic. so sorry to break into all seriousness right away, but uh, it's been good for me this week. I've been, I just completed the first five great wheels for my timepiece uh, with uh, what's called the rounding up tool arms. Uh, an old watchmaker's tool that we use by uh, manual uh, labor, let's say, to uh, file the teeth, the teeth uh, yeah. and round them, round them after they come off uh, the regular machines. If they're they have little nibs on them and so forth, uh, it cleans them up and shapes them a certain way. And when they made machines back then, and in, in they made them as a piece of art. So the wheel that we would turn manually like this to make it go, the arms within it had this pattern in it, and it's just so beautiful. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So I've incorporated that into the great wheel, which is an offset great wheel in my movement that you'll be able to see uh, turning. It's, uh, and it can, they, it's a lot of work, but it came out. Um, Fantastic. Very fabulous, yeah. so hard at work. So if my eyes start going like this, 
when my brain starts going like this, you know why. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> How you it's, doing over there, Johnny? Hey, Mike? Everything is fantastic here. We're uh, getting like it is. I, I'm keeping very busy. It's uh, thankfully I really love what I do. So, like yourself, it's you know, it's not a job. It's uh, something that you you throw yourself into fully. And uh, I, I enjoy seeing a lot of the, what's happening, some of the new pieces that are coming out. I work with uh, a great friend of mine, Pietro Tomayer from the Limited Edition. Do a lot of writing, a lot of content there, um, as well as working on uh, the occasional website, uh, which one of which has gone live this week as well. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, Pietro rules. That's all I can say. If you don't know who Pietro is, you, you all need to find Pietro. Yeah, well, there, there's Pietro's comment. Thank you very much indeed, Pietro. <laughs> I appreciate the, the effort that goes in. So, uh, and even whenever this is over tonight, we will uh, do. There's still a lot of stuff to be done tonight. So, uh, well, I, I know we got we got another crazy on here. We uh, sure do. Uh, and with some killer news and great stories, and you know, it, a watchmaker's work never stops. We're never satisfied. We're never happy as an independent. We're always pushing the boundaries. It's very similar to being, you know, in that thrash metal mindset of music. Um, yeah. You know, we're never happy. We're never done unless someone pushes us to be done. And uh, this this gentleman is once again pushing those boundaries into a new territory, and uh, he kicks ass at, at everything he does. So. Well, we're, we're about to find out about some kick ass. We sure are. <laughs> the, so we're going to, uh, you see, the guest that we have back tonight or have tonight is uh, a man who on the, at the last, he just, he, on the day that we were going live with our first episode, I happened to be in telephone conversation with him and I said, oh, we're doing this tonight. And he's going, wow, that's fantastic. I wish you the very best of luck. And I said, Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we hope that uh, we will be able to get a chat with you someday on it and uh, because that's the kind of thing that we want to do. And he's going, oh, yeah, great. I'd be happy. And I just said, uh, what about tonight? And he said, well, you tell him, John. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> so uh, I was honoured to be part on the prologue. <laughs> <laughs> on the uh, prologue. So, yeah. Um, so, so everyone would just like to welcome. It's uh, John McGonagall, and uh, who is one of he and he. But John, do you like the expression "master watchmaker"? Mm. No, <laughs> I don't think any of us really like that. <laughs> really, that's no. interesting because yeah. we were talking about this tonight. Because, uh, well, it's it's uh, the way that we would that people like me would perceive uh, someone like uh, yourself. So. Uh, jo John has been uh, one of, the, let's put it this way, one of the world's finest watchmakers and uh, who's really at, at the top of his game and uh, a man who is meticulous in detail. That I, if, a, if a watch has been worked on by John, it, has, it is absolutely blemish free or as close as it is humanly possible to achieve so john welcome and thank you for returning tonight and uh we're hopefully going to have a bit of uh, fun looking at some of your uh the work that you've been doing recently and also some big news that you have to break you could choose to do that at any time you could do that now or we could do it in half an hour's time whatever you prefer what's up john thanks very much it's a pleasure to be back guys. Uh, how are you dan very good. So good to see you again. And you. Uh, um, so uh, congratulations on your great wheels. I, I, you must post a photograph up uh, soon. I'm sure you will on Instagram if you haven't already, but I'm dying to see them. Uh, I think uh, the way you made them as well is quite interesting and quite pertinent to what we're going to discuss. Uh, you used traditional techniques which you know if you had a, a restoration to do that needed a wheel that's how you do it it's uh mm -hmm. and uh a lot of people would say it's the best way to do it as well you know but um absolutely uh, yeah yeah so i think we you know that's that's what we what we have 
when we and Johnny agreed that we would get together and, and do this this series, we agreed that it would be quite different than anything that's ever been done before because I don't care and I don't have to care. So we get, we, we'd like to get the true information um, about the crazy watchmaker, you know, locked in his room with all these machines and how we really operate, even at a levels where we, we can acquire the tools we need, the machines we need, or have friends that have the machines we can't afford. But in the end result, all that schooling and what we learned in school, like you just said about how to make wheels the traditional way is still the best way. And that's, that's what we do. And it's a, uh, it's an art and uh, you're going to, you, I know you were going to yeah. touch upon that tonight. You know, my background in restoration for so many years and you know, th that's how we get our experience. And, and you're once again, <laughs> taking it to a new level <laughs> with what you're about to tell us. But I, I, I think uh, most of, um, the independents are most of those who would eventually go on to make a watch uh, would have come from restoration backgrounds as opposed to say after sale service or directly training to uh, make a watch um, some of the schools uh, you know you, you mentioned that um, that school in France in I uh, can't remember the name of the town where all those amazing watchmakers are coming from at the moment. That's awesome. uh, uh, Johnny. That's Switzerland. Basin so no, not Basin so It's uh, it's closer to, to Switzerland. I, I, I just have a mental blank. blank. But yeah. um, they take all of the top students from um, the uh, watchmaking schools throughout France, and they do a one-year course. Uh, it's like a post-grad course where they learn how to uh, design on CAD mm -hmm. and then produce their watches and then finish them to the highest level. And uh, so they've been making tourbillons, they've made petrol calendars. I've worked with some of these guys in Clara and they're amazing watchmakers. So they're almost the exception in that they're, uh, you know, bypassing the restoration and they're going straight to, to actually making watches. But for the most part, I think most independents have restoration as part of their as a the mainstay of their background really yeah mm -hmm. uh, i think george daniels used to say that uh you know he he made he did restoration for so many years and uh when you you, you might get a watch in that is missing a component or it's got a broken component you have to redesign make and finish the parts so as it blends into what was already there and um in doing so if you've done that for an, enough years, you'll eventually have made virtually every part of the watch. So right. making a watch is not such a gigantic step at that point. So uh, I think we owe a lot to restoration. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And now what I'm, what I'm trying to let people know, young watchmakers or watchmakers still in school, is that those 972 jobs that you have to learn that George Daniels wrote in his book that we have to be as watchmakers to make our own timepiece has just increased now because we have to learn CAD, really at least CAD to be able to help me even in restoration work. It helps us greatly to, if we have a, a, let's say in a chronograph, a mounted minute recorder spring is very common to break. And I know in the old days when I was restoring timepieces, uh, if that broke, we really, it was really difficult to make by hand. if not impossible. We wouldn't, if, if the watch didn't warrant the work and now it got put in a drawer, and it was gone forever, uh, hence why we have vintage watches in low numbers right now. But that uh, knowing CAD now enables us to remake those parts more swiftly and at least get all the dimensions mm -hmm. down. And, uh, and I see yeah, a lot of the schools are, are adding that on, a, a nice one-year course to learn SolidWorks or something similar like that. Definitely, definitely, please take that. Absolutely. Course. I think it's such a valuable tool because even if you're making the parts, uh, you can you know measure up design, Mm -hmm. outsource the fabrication of the part, right. maybe do additional functions once you get it back. And of course, you know, there's still, when it comes off the machine, there's still an awful lot of work to do. Because, I, I think uh, some people, I, just, I don't like, want them to be scared and think, oh, that's not traditional watchmaking. I'm not going to be doing CNC work, so I don't need that course. I, I think you, you should certainly rethink that, especially you can hear John uh, also saying the same thing. We all work with it, all independents. We need to. Uh, or we or we have to hire someone to do it at one point in time, and that's costly. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think as well, uh, it's useful to think of uh, CAD as a drawing board, 
and his CNC as a as a fret saw, <laughs> you know, very sophisticated fret saw, in that um, uh, you are the same thought process goes into designing a part on um, a, a three D CAD tool as it does on a drawing board. You know, like you are trying to produce a part in metal. And so you're using the dimensioning, you're working with space. And at, at that point as well, where you introduce the, uh, the aesthetic designs and shapes, which as we'll see later on the watch we're going to look at, uh, mm. are completely over the top and unnecessary to the function of the watch, but important as uh, uh, high-end, high-grade watches, you know, because they don't just to uh, either tell the time or act a stop as a stopwatch or have a calendar function. They also have to do it in a almost poetic fashion. You know, they have to uh, uh, they have to do it in a beautiful way, really, to you know um, to satisfy yeah. the the both craftsmanship mm -hmm. and the collector. You know, yeah, we, uh, have, we, but, have, to, um, we have to we, keep those those old parts exactly as they were, John. Um, you know, and it's, it makes life a little bit easier, even though in the, when we went to school and nowadays still, you know, it's that pain of learning how to draw it manually, you know, in the schools now they're still taught that you still have mm -hmm. to know that it's just that CAD will help you bring everything into 3d. Uh, we can yeah. expand the parts. Uh, listen, I just went myself for a year of that, uh, to get where I am here. I didn't know how to do that. So uh, I'm only pushing it mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I, I it opened up my whole world. So once you can, you know, extract yeah. that part in, part in 3D, you were looking at the real part. The first time, few times you do it and you see your watch part there, it's mind blowing. You're like, wow, you know, <laughs> this is so cool, man. Yeah. Like, wow, all the part, I wish I yeah. had this many years ago when I was, you know, doing a lot of Patek Philippe restorations for many years in my workshop. It would have helped tremendously. I wish I would have learned it. So we're, we're, we're pushers, we're like I drug pushers, move. but instead of drugs, it, like in the old days when I was young playing music, instead of drugs, you were pushing good stuff on you. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That makes you feel yeah, good in a different way. We, yeah. <laughs> we still have to get we still have to get some of those stories out of you, Dan. But like, uh, um, oh, yeah. um, I, I saw a really good uh, use of CAD on Facebook. Uh, I think it was today, uh, and it was on a clock. Um, I, I wish I knew who did it. It was uh, it was a, a brilliant post. Uh, there was a, a series of images followed by a video, and it was of uh, a, a very large wheel, probably a great wheel for a clock. And it was about the diameter of my head. You know, it was a very large component. Uh, but instead of being round, it was not out of flat. Uh, you know, as in the the flat plane. Mm. If you look at it straight on, the plan. I should get my hands into the camera. If you look at the plan, one side was completely flattened. You know, a toothed gear, you kind of say, you know, take the dimensions off and make a new one. But they uh, took the dimensions off it and drew a cor theoretically correct uh, wheel. And then they used vices, blow torches, pliers, and just coaxed it into shape mm. uh, until it matched up with the CAD drawing. And wow. Uh, wow. it was fantastic. And, and then they refinished it, mounted on the axe. And, and um, if anybody out there who's watching this has seen that post, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to know who it is because it's, uh, it, you know, you know, on Facebook, you, you make contact with an awful lot of people who you don't know personally, or you just share the same passion. Mm. And uh, so I, I don't know this person, but it was a really cool job and a very, um, interesting mixture of, you know, the old, as in the piece he was working on and, you know, and a bang up to date, uh, tool. So it was a uh, good smart. Social media is so amazing uh, for this, for these younger watchmakers, isn't it, John? What a tool that we wish we had way back when, right? But I'm sure you and certainly I, you'd see stuff on Facebook and you kind of go, oh, that's brilliant. You get an idea or you, know, you come away with a, a new technique, you know, uh, there's such a, a wealth of ideas that are shared. It's incredible. Uh, and what uh, we had was like, really uh, we, in America, we had a magazine called Horological Times way back then. 
and you know yeah. putting for pictures remember, of yeah. what's overseas you know what, what are people doing that's all it was like in music when we would just you know open up the big double album of like the allman brothers at fillmore east and just like stare at it from like endless hours as your friend was like you know cleaning the seeds out of the weed trying to roll joints and stuff but <laughs> you know it's, now the kids don't even have seeds in their weed i hear i don't know anything about that because i don't do any drugs or anything like that i could never do what i do here and do drugs <laughs> it's just residual drugs that's left in my head <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. but no no it's a wealth of, variety. there's a wealth of information out yeah. there and and really you know if you're a young watchmaker um you know listen to john the guests that me and johnny have on here each week listen to them try to get in their brain and utilize social media and not only for for like John said, uh, seeing incredible stuff, but you have your own free television station. You have your own free magazine that will be Instagram. You know, you have, it's free, you know, utilize it to, to push your, your art, whatever your art will be. It's free. We didn't have those luxuries back then. Uh, we had to go learn from other masters and take a job that we might not even like just to learn something for a year. And that will be a year of our life. We gave away. Um, you can, really move forward more swiftly nowadays. So anyway, I'm done pushing more stuff on you. Let's get back to John and talk about, um, you know, restoration, John, your history and restoration quickly uh, as, at the bench well, has been. Yeah, uh, it's uh, I kind of started in the same way as you did. My first job out of college was, uh, was doing tr uh, trade repair. So you do about 15 watches a day and you'd have a pile on one side, the in and the you know, you're trying to get them across the bench to the out sector, you know. So I did that for about, um, oh, God, about two years, uh, both in England and in Ireland. And, uh, um, uh, you, you know, you learn no matter what you're doing. You always, I saw an awful lot of stuff and everything like that and uh, learn how to uh, manage my work. But ultimately... I really wanted to get much deeper into into watches and uh, uh, understand them so much more because it's frustrating taking something apart that you're scared of, mm. uh, cleaning it and putting it back together. Uh, you know, you, you you don't dare do too much to it in case in case you wreck it. The consequences of that are are, are grave because you don't have someone beside you who can who can get you out of trouble mm -hmm. uh so you you intervene as little as possible to get the watch going and uh so it was good for me to have experienced that but i i, I knew uh um that uh i didn't want to <laughs> keep to work, working like that so i best way of getting the knowledge i wanted was to go to switzerland so I went to Wostep. Now I did. I only did the the five month course, the the refresher course, or uh, the Cours de Perfectionnement, as they called it at the time, uh, where you were meant to have already have a watchmaking qualification and some experience, and then they took you and you know brushed up your uh, knowledge. And uh, but it was so much more than that. It was um, in a sense. What year was that, John? The it was. 91, 1991, and um, so Antoine Simonet was uh, the only teacher there at the time, and mm -hmm. uh, we were in the old building, not the, the current one, and uh, mm -hmm. there, was, there, were, there was some expansion works going on there, so you'd work men coming in and out with wheelbarrows and stuff like that. It was a little chaotic, <laughs> but um, you had... Uh, Peter Speak on the course at the same time. He was doing the complicated course while I was doing the the, the refresher course, and uh, the formal part of it. So the wheel flattening, end plays, uh, hairspring making, escapings, that sort of thing, uh, chronographs. Um, that was easy enough for me because I'd already spent three years at a Swiss school in in Dublin, mm. and uh, so. You people with varying degrees of uh, uh, experience, and uh, depending on which schools they've gone to and what they've done since. So, uh, for coming from the school I came from, that I'd come from, it, it, that wasn't the most challenging part. Um, what was um, 
challenging was uh, the pieces of restoration that we were given. Uh, we weren't necessarily given really nice pieces. Uh, we were given uh, pieces, some enough, some uh, many of them enough now, you know, and they could have bits missing and bits mm -hmm. broken. They could have had a really, really rough life. And uh, we had to find, um, we didn't know, it wasn't treated like a school piece where you had to give it back in absolutely pristine condition. It was a real world experience. You had to use what's available, like maybe modify, like we a hell of a lot of uh, old parts and we could uh, root through the, par the parts box, take whatever we needed out, modify it. In some cases you'd have to completely remake parts, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but it really taught you how to use your ingenuity. Right. And uh, I think for the short course that it was, the amount of watchmakers that came from there and went on to really high positions in the watch industry, uh, it was quite phenomenal, you know? Isn't it, I think isn't an awful it, of, lot of it was. You know, it's, it's crazy because I was, I was there in what, 94, 95, uh, in the new building with Antoine Simonet as my instructor as well. Yeah. And this, that's before he, he was just starting the implementation of trying to push the course to any other schools that would have it around the world as we, we needed a good watchmakers taught correctly. And I think Antoine Simonet, you know, he's, he's the godfather, you know, and I keep pushing him out there mm -hmm. to show people exactly what you just said. I didn't mean to interrupt you, John, at the very end there is to reaffirm no, everyone. No. I've, I've been saying this, the, from the time that you went to the time around where I went, he, this one man, not only wrote this curriculum uh, and and showed us how to work in a school environment completely different than anywhere else, um, but he launched people such as yourself, me. I mean, it's endless names that that have just come out of that short mm. time period that you know he was there doing his thing and and you know letting people in the school go at their own pace to catch the fastest person. And like you said, that real world experience you just explained. Um, I would like anyone that's a watchmaker, uh, a newer watchmaker, or uh, that wants to go into after sale service to understand, this is how we worked back then. I would have draws and draws, endless draws of random parts. We would go to flea markets and marts we had in America every month and just spend all our money on parts, parts, even though we didn't need them, just boxes mm. of parts because the past generation watchmakers were dying. They were in their 80s. It was usually their their wife that was still there selling them and would only sell them to someone who was a real, would do something with them. So John is, is, is explaining, we would reach in our draw and it, we would try to cross reference it with the books we have to get something close. And then we would have to modify it. Mm. And that's how we worked in true restorations. Then we come across the part, like John said, you know, we couldn't find it. We don't have it. So we got to make it. Now it's completely different, John. There is no parts for it, you know, unless someone hoarded them. Um, you know, we, we have to make them all this generation. Yes. Well, I am going to suggest that we take a look at uh, one of the projects that you've worked on most recently, John, because we've got a, quite a bit to uh, fit in here this evening. And, uh, uh, you know, because what you're talking about, Dan, about the collecting of parts and going to the marts and uh, acquiring bits and pieces as you go along, because as you, two points, one of the things is, yes, the watchmakers are getting older. Uh, I have a wonderful friend who's a, a, a lo local watchmaker, but man, he's in his 80s. And, you know, uh, apart from traveling a uh, considerable distance, uh, there's, there's nobody really local taking this up. And you touched on the Swiss Irish Institute of Horology, John, as well, where you were fortunate yeah. enough to have three years there. That's gone. So there's no formal... Ed center of education here in Ireland anymore for budding watchmakers. They have to go across the water to England, at, at least England, or perhaps uh, over to Switzerland or onto the continent. Uh, not necessarily Switzerland, but I'm sure Germany, France, uh, Spain all have their uh, uh, watchmaking academies. Or, we don't have one here in Ireland anymore. Or, or Cambodia, where my brother works. Totally amazing. What a setup they have created there, isn't it? It's state of the art. It's, it's incredible. State, it's state of the art and fantastic to see that. And you can be sure because. Have you seen it, Dan? No. 
Yeah, it's a new academy in Cambodia. Dan, you'd, really? you'd weep if you saw the equipment. It's incredible. In yeah, Cambodia, no, have a look. Like it's, Cambodia, uh, Cambodia. I think it's the, Cambodia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Amazing. Uh, my, bro my brother, An my brother Anthony is the teacher there. So wow, Can I didn't know that. Oh, neither did I. Flipping the heck. Is he also Are you a guys? Dude? Is there a McGonagall everywhere? Is really? <laughs> Yeah, multiplying later in yeah. life <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating that's at least one on each continent <laughs> yeah that's wow, wow. no check, check that it out i think it's I, I think it's uh the prince watchmaking school or prince horology but if you put in watchmaking school cambodia it's extraordinary you will flip out when you see the equipment it's completely straight the yeah, I'm i have never I'm seen a free. school like it in switzerland wow yeah, we had like this yeah so hey wouldn't it be nice if one day we could uh john if we could get a some kind of an institute or an academy or a course that a, at least a, a starter course or an entry level uh that gets people involved in watchmaking and iron because people are buying watches and they're buying mechanical watches with increasing uh popularity nowadays and every single one of those watches is going to require servicing throughout its lifetime if you do not service your watch every the recommended is maybe five years, three years, five years. People will always stretch that out as long as possible. But you'll actually start mm. wearing parts down, and that will need to be replaced, and they're expensive components. And uh, so I, I think I would love to see, in my time, I'd love to see uh, some academy starting up again here in Ireland. And maybe, hey, we'll talk about that another day, because I want uh, on this uh, occasion, because... It's a special uh, edition for me because it's something that I wanted to sort of move in this direction. And that is to look at uh, a specific field of expertise of craftsmanship within the the life of the watchmaker. And to the, uh, one of the watches that you were working on recently, John, is 130 years old. And now that's old by our standards, but in the terms of watchmaking, it's pretty young actually because so what yeah. back to um i was looking at uh, a, a guy we've been talking to in the next few weeks 1740 i think was the first valet de jeu uh pocket watch so you're going back that's 300 years all but a few years here so uh so this well, you go back you go back 500 years because uh the first uh like uh the first Okay, they're closer to clocks than watches, but uh, the first portable timepieces were from the 1500s. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's all yeah. based on the same principles, the same fundamental values. Yes, it's been refined. Yes, it's been advanced over the yeah. years. Mm -hmm. But that's right. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to look at some parts you'll now. Two, and two, you'll have two to ears, you'll have mainsprings, you'll have all of the essential uh, organs of the watch like the power the train the escapement the balance all there they they, they cracked that 500 years ago now there's been so much evolution since obviously but uh uh they're they're extraordinary pieces uh and uh it, yeah. it beggars belief that they were made 500 years ago just with files and you can just imagine how crude those were. no electricity you know? so um, i think uh that's no. why I, I i periodically uh, speak about um, independent watchmakers that are making their own timepieces. That we uh, we use the same metals that they used back then because we did restorations for so long and we know what lasts. And the only thing they you know they were messing with back then from 500 years ago till now, you know they they like we the advancement was always mainly in the escapement, changing escapements, fi finding better ways to change one-way rotation of the wheels being pushed from the mainspring to a back and forth motion that the balance in the hairspring need with recoil rebound so we just get you know basically the wheels and 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 the hairspring and the balance stayed the same from ship chronometers to wristwatches it's always messing with the escapement like, mm. I'm, like I'm messing with the escapement on mine same thing no oil so you know yeah. made out of titanium same thing but people like John and people like me we know what lasts you know certain kinds of brass last certain kind of steel last we don't like to dive into silicon and all this stuff that's trial and error where there'll be no parts later on we we want our whatever we work on 
to be able to be traditionally repaired for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ahead by anyone that comes out of a good school and has the machines, uh, all, everything we work on, you don't have to worry about parts. Because I know that, that's a big thing, John. I don't know if you know that in the, in the collectors, they're always like, why should I buy an independence piece? Uh, how am I gonna get it fixed if it breaks? And they don't realize that it's the other way around, that it's the big companies that they only have to you know, supply you with parts for 20 years. That's the Swiss law, first of all. And after that, you know, they, they, they won't even sell parts to independent watchmakers to repair them unless they do 19 different courses that they keep changing every 18 months mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, monopolize it. So you're actually way better off uh, working with an independent, no matter what they're working on, because it, anything they're doing can be repaired by any competent watchmaker who, who's traditionally trained. Well, I think uh, Jurgen, Jurgensen is a great um, example of that. Like in 130 years, we haven't even become more refined, you know. And uh, so, um, I can't do you believe. have any images over there, Johnny? We're, we're going. That's why I was just waiting for the opportunity to run with this because I have about seven or eight images that uh, I wanted to uh, run. Uh, the watch that we're talking about is this. Uh, it is a Jules Jurgensen. It is a minute repeater with Rattrapant split second chronograph. Um, is that the correct definition of it, John? Uh, yes, the, uh, the Rattrapant is, is French for split second chronograph. So it's a split second chronograph yeah. and, or Rattrapant chronograph. And the age of that watch? You reckon it's 130, 130 uh, yeah, years, it's, so it's uh, from it's 1890? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I can't recall the exact year, but yeah. That's okay. There. We'll let you off of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's 1890. Okay. Just for a couple of... Go ahead. A couple of things about uh, the... Uh, just from what we see there, I had the most unusual experience with... Uh, the watch because uh the client had just bought it he gave it to me and said listen i i want it brought back to as close to original condition as possible and uh um he had just purchased and handed it straight over to me so when i got home uh i saw that the i couldn't get the to change the time on it and uh i uh um I thought that there was something wrong with the mechanism, either something out of place or missing or something. So I took it apart and I couldn't see anything wrong. In fact, the watch is in uh, really nice, uh, like the components were really nicely original. And I could only imagine that something was missing, something very, very small. And uh, I emailed the client and said, listen, uh, I've never had to do this before, but how do you, ch how do you set the time? <laughs> your watch? And he said, I don't know. I just, Whoa, just, you're the guy who's my watch. Said, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. I said, Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll just, Here, I, let, let's take a look at what you were, what you had to I, work with anyway. So, uh, th this is so the. Just, if, you just, if you could go back to the last image, uh, to the watch itself. Uh, yeah, to the watch itself. I, I saw that there was a mechanism in the bow. So uh, can you use your, use your cursor to hover over the bow just to show? I don't think it works that way. Right? Can, uh, the bow, obviously. Oh, you can't, okay. Right. No. And so it's the, it's the loop or, or the hoop around the, the winder, the crown. okay? Yeah. Uh, the crown. So to, to set the time, it only, the way it is, it only winds, okay? And you can't pull it out the way you would in a normal watch. So you take the bow and you pivot it until it's right over the dial. And then you can feel a little bit of resistance and you keep pushing until it's touching the bezel. And then you can do it. And it was a, a mechanism that was specific to you, Jorgensen. Hmm. And uh, it's a very elegant system. The other thing you'll notice is do you, if you see the pushers at 12 o'clock and close to 2 o'clock, they're for the chronograph, and they only work when the lid is open. So it's a, a protection. You can see when the lid closes, it's uh, the rim of the lid stops those pushers from mm. from functioning. Okay, okay, that's okay. the backside of it. That's the backside of it. Beautiful. But, um, 
Beautiful indeed, Dan. I, I, I watched John uh, working on this watch uh, over the last number of weeks. He has been giving updates on uh, the progress of the restoration on it. Mm. And it just blew me away, the complexity, the sophistication, the absolute beauty of those little components that were manufactured. 1890, there was no electricity, guys, was there, so to speak? Um, so you're talking uh, hand, literally hand-machined components. Uh, I don't think, I don't mm, think uh, yeah. you know, people really do realize, because um, they just think, you know, it's a pocket watch back then. Oh, oh well, that's pretty cool, yeah. and it's big. But let's put that into perspective. That, you know, they were working under oil lamps and candles, and, you know, the, the lathes, that we have here are run by motors and electricity, uh, even though they're very old, like my, uh, my Chablin is from the 30s, they yeah. were you know, turning a wheel by hand and making what you're seeing right now. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. How about that? Uh, yeah, that's the uh, pincers for the split seconds um, mechanism or the retropunt mechanism. Yeah. That has... Um, you, you, um, so it, that grips the split seconds wheel, which, and on the other side, on the dial side of the split seconds wheel, you have the split seconds hand. So when those pincers are closed, it grips the wheel and stops it moving, while the chronograph continues to move around. Now you have a double, uh, you would have photographed there, Johnny, I think, with uh, the two wheels. Uh, in this, do you have that? Okay, do I have that one? I don't know if I have that one uploaded. Uh, no, I don't have that one uploaded. Maybe John, if you uh, go back to the the overview yeah, of the movement, go back to the, uh, overview of the movement on the other side. There you go. There you go. Let now, there see. you can see. Uh, if it's possible to enlarge that, to, to I can't. I can't expand that. Uh, okay. um, let me see. Does that no? Uh, sorry. No, no. It's, I just go ahead. If you okay on the top, so running from the center of the photograph towards about the half seven position, you can see those uh, that pincers. It's hard to pick it out because there's yes, so many other components yeah. there, but but there's a little square. Uh, at the short end, so at the end furthest from the center, and uh, when that ro rotates, it either that actually opens and closes the pincer. Mm -hmm. pincer. In the center, uh, you can see the chronograph wheel. It's underneath the bridge, and you have a heart piece, so a heart-shaped cam resting on top. And uh, well, it's pushed on top, so it turns with the chronograph wheel. And the the ratrapant wheel has been removed. Uh, that has a lever that uh, presses against that heart cam piece. So when the pincers are closed and they block the ratrapant wheel, the chronograph continues to rotate. The ratrapant obviously is stationary, but when you push the button to open the pincers again, it's on the ratrapant wheel, is pressing against the heart piece, and it centers. So it catches up with the chronograph wheel, and uh, you know, as a consequence as well, the two hands which have diverged on the dial side, they catch up with the chronograph wheel, uh, the split seconds wheel yes. catches up with the... So we can look beautifully at that a little bit closer. It, it, yeah, yeah. Th th this uh, absolutely blew me away. So th perfect, there is perfect. that's the picture we're looking for, bro. Hey, who, this is that's multitasking cool. here, yeah. man. This is <laughs> doing <laughs> image, yeah. editing, image yeah. editing on the hoof. Let me tell you. Well, <laughs> well so there you trying can, to explain you how how a ratchet pant works because not many people get to see this. Uh, I know when I went to to early days in school, uh, you know, this is one of the most complicated mechanisms because I was a chronograph freak. Uh, that you could get, you know, try to get your hands on. It's yeah. seriously complicated. And for people uh, wondering what this was used for, um, let's say we had two runners running a race or a lot of runners and you needed to time the first runner and the second runner. This is what this stopwatch was used for. 
you could time two separate people yes. and get two uh, separate uh, readings. Yeah, I, I have a split second chronograph myself and uh, I, I absolutely love it. And uh, John's going to be coming familiar with it in the near future. I am. Another thing that's worth noting is if you can see the, uh, the center wheel, so that's the wheel, it's underneath to the split seconds wheel and the chronograph wheel. Uh, you have a bridge, and then you have a, a, a wheel with larger teeth. It, the edge yeah. of it just goes over the rim of the balance. Okay, uh, that's the center wheel. So that's the uh, your uh, minute hand would be geared into that. Like you have a, a pinion on the other side that has that's mounted directly onto that wheel. So that wheel is an hour. It's got a hole drilled right through it for the chronograph wheel. Okay, and it's a fairly thick movement because you've got a minute repeat on the other side, uh, yes. and so on the other side you've another pinion carrying three cams. You've got your hour wheel on this side with the hole through it, the chronograph wheel going through that, and then your uh, split seconds wheel going through all the entire thing. Yeah. Uh, it's it, incredibly difficult today. To hand make, I mean, to make with the machines that we have uh, a, a split second wheel that length is horribly difficult because when you start to, uh, if you start with a hardened piece of metal and uh, cut it with carbon uh, uh, tungsten carbide tools, which we have the luxury of of having that they didn't have, uh, if you cut that much blued metal away. Uh, it, you have tension built up inside the the axe inside the material uh that when you've whittled it down to the dimension required to pass through the chronograph wheel it will distort mm. uh it's uh it, you know like when you harden material there are always distortions in it and when you machine it those distortions can come to the surface or rather the surface comes down to those distortions and it can actually physically bend the material so what they had done was uh, they cut that uh, from soft steel mild steel and then they would have hardened it but the thermic shock of that uh, shaft hitting hot oil or hot water to do that to harden it sufficiently without distortion is very difficult and i would say that they made several of them. oh yeah but they eventually use them to watch yeah absolutely yeah. made several so, uh, we, we know that from yeah. uh you know ourselves john from hot what would john's trying to explain hardening and tempering uh many people who might be listening in other industries you just think it's hardening and tempering but when our parts get this small and, and this is a pocket watch remember it gets smaller to wrist watches for us um usually you know uh, they deform and that's why if you do follow watchmakers uh, and you can see nowadays on, on social media, some of us bluing things and we have it wrap, wrapped that little part in tons and tons of iron wire. And then it's inside another little box. Um, you're getting the point of what John is speaking about. We're trying to stop that deformation from happening and having to us to start completely over and make that part from scratch again. Um, and we've only learned that from you know, bad experiences, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I, I saw a question. Yeah, exactly. I saw a question. Bernard. Yeah. Yes. If the uh, hairspring is thermically blued as well. And, and it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's also very difficult to make a hairspring. So to put all the bends, it's got an overcoil in it. Uh, to make all of those bends and not remove the blue, it's, very very hard and it's it's impeccable but um yeah yes yeah, beautiful yeah. piece i mean yeah. my 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 whole so, goal for good, getting into complications john was uh i saw my first chronograph at, at very early in my life and that was kind of my goal way back when and you know getting to do pieces like this i don't know if even people understand what they're looking at and i try to explain to them you know chronographs and and split second chronographs how they work with all the little levers that need to go and, and actuate at exact moments in time and not break. Um, and you know, you're, you're showing a lot of uh, people watching here, how complicated 
our timepieces can be, but still be robust and last this long and and work. It's it, they they they'll be here forever as yeah. long as they're taken care of properly. Some of the things you could look out for, like on this picture here, you could see on the left around seven o'clock, there's a uh, very thin uh, springs that that um, hold certain parts in tension, and, and that tension has to be exact. Something we learn in school and um, working on timepieces, or where a certain time somebody else who's worked on many of the same timepieces will show us those levers and those springs need to be manually adjusted with our tweezers without messing up and pushing just a little too hard and then pop they go across the room and there is no the second part to just screw in there it's, there's no replacement parts so it's very delicate work what john does it's very living yeah. on the edge of of killing everyone around you and yourself at all times <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also the um with the just the tension of the springs as well because if you have a spring that's too thick if you bend it to one extremity of its function the, it'll power up a lot and at the end of its function it mightn't have enough force so what we do an awful lot is make the springs an awful lot thinner so for the proportion of their length they're thinner and at the point of the function you've got, so between one extremity and the other, uh, you have a, a more constant torque. And does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you kind of thin it and then you bend it stronger uh, mm -hmm. so that it has uh, a more even force throughout its entire function. And the importance yeah. of uh, having things not too strong is that uh, particularly in a mechanism with it's, so levers and uh, if you have something that's too strong, the next thing be able, to, and the next thing won't be able to push that along. So you end up making everything stronger, and then there's not enough power to drive. We're wasting, we're wasting so inertia. there's a, a real we're wasting the main balance and run down. Yeah, there's a real balance act throughout. It so, yeah, is. a good example I like to use, John, is uh, perhaps somebody has like a Rolex Daytona or some form of chronograph. Oh, and they, speak they say, of the devil. They say, they say, why does, why does my, you know, my mounted, my, my minute recorder, you know, why does it jump two numbers sometimes? Why does it jump, you know, why, why doesn't it jump properly? And on that wheel called the mounted minute recorder, we have a mounted minute recorder spring. It's very, very thin. It has to be adjusted every time the watch is completely disassembled and overhauled. Most of the time, if the gentleman is, is not a true watchmaker and traditionally trained, he usually hacks that up and it's broken because it is so, so thin. It's, it's like the, the, the thickness of maybe a little thicker than a human hair, maybe at its center there. And we have to adjust that for proper attention to get that number to jump properly, but not like John said, suck the power down, down the line. And now instead of you put your watch down at your night, on your nightstand and it previously would last 46 hours of rundown, uh, till it's dead. Now, if you have a lot of springs that are too tight, you're only going to get 35 hours. So it's just another one of those things that we learn when we're restoring uh, many, many timepieces. Yeah, from, yeah. From, that's from interesting. Or that that so, comment, as you mentioned, or the the Daytona, or that uh, Kenny uh, just mentioned, or that Rolex won't repair his 77 Daytona because they don't have all the parts. So wh wh where does uh, does does Kenny turn to? to Dan or to, to John to, to, to get that watch repaired or? Yeah, you, you're, you're a specialist. I know uh, um, Stephen worked with uh, um, Samlo Antiques and that subsequently became Stephen Hale Watch Repair. Okay. And I know they, they specialize in making parts for the tunnels that, uh, that are obsolete. And so you can, uh, I'd say, short of a detona being sawed in half <laughs> to be able to sort you out you know like uh there are specialists <laughs> out there uh uh rolex i think they're a great company but like uh uh you know they're very straight up about uh um how long they guarantee their watches for and for the vintage pieces normally and it depends on the country you're in but normally the direct uh clients with very old pieces to a specialist in their area who will be able to sort them out. But so, yeah, that's the, it's a prime, so example, prime example of what I was saying earlier. It, the law in Switzerland is 20 years. Some companies 
go beyond because they just have certain parts that you may need on the shelf. But beyond that, uh, legally, they don't have to. And so that's where yeah. people such as John and myself, uh, you know, or previously for me, that's what we did. You know, you came into my shop with your vintage Patek Philippe and there was no more parts. So that's. Yep. yep. Uh, I saw there was another question earlier on about the, the Rattrapont wheel. That's uh, the question there. Yeah. There you go. Uh, John works, forest, John works on a lot on, on Valjean 72s, which is probably what's in your old Daytona derivative of that. So he probably has all your parts, yeah. but he's not giving you the part. <laughs> no, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, I'm the Rattrapont wheel and the... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. So I'm <laughs> um, with the, the Rattrapont wheel in the. Uh, it is toothless, and uh, it's a steel wheel, and teeth are actually the perfect triangles. They're really, really well cut, uh, and they're tiny. Now they don't work like normal teeth because they don't gear into anything at all. Uh, the only purpose they serve is uh, as grips uh, because you don't want the, uh, like when the pincers close on the uh, on the Rattrapont wheel, uh, you don't want it to slip. Uh, otherwise, the, the Rattrapont wheel uh, hand, you'll see a little bit of movement as, you know, when it's meant to be completely stationary. So the teeth only serve as grips for the pincers. But yes, they're there. Yep, and that okay. same. Uh, uh, I should also point out yeah. there's that that photograph there is of the watch after the restoration. The bigger photograph you showed earlier on, Johnny, of the uh, that one there, that's before the restoration. Yeah. So it's not in terrible condition, but but everything's a little bit scratched. Mm. Well, I, I'm going to show you. I'm going to necessitate taking everything apart and. Rebelling, re re regraining, uh, all of the main plates, the bridges, everything was redecorated. It was a work of about uh, a month. Well, did I, you, I mean, uh, did you have to, a lot of work. Did you have to re rhodium anything, John? No, it's, uh, no, it's uh, untreated German silver. Right. Well, we're yeah. going to run through this because, uh, like, we still have some massive news, John, and maybe we should have run with that from the start. Yeah, um, let's, let's get to that. Afterwards, but I want to just before we get to the rest uh, through the restorations, just to show what you're talking about. Uh, before I know, th yeah, at that point, there, or there you go. Yeah, uh, so the first photograph, uh, I had done the beveling and the, the, the so the bevels are refiled, uh, and polished sink around the jewel and the screw, they're repolished. Well, and there I've uh, had to make up jigs uh, for each component that had to be refinished. Magnificent. And there was a, a yeah. circular finish uh, yeah. on. Magnificent. So that's uh, the escape wheel bridge with a, uh, it's got a, a rose gold uh, uh, um, pla jewel plate on top. Yeah. And uh, flat polishing ro uh, gold is always tricky. It, it doesn't, you know, you can polish it, but to remove the last scratches, a pain in the neck. And wow. um, it's there it's finally man, finished. Man, and man, the man. screws as well, they're finished, they're flat polished on uh, on, on a zinc on a tin block with um, paste. Mm. So magnificent, absolutely. Uh, as I said, I wanted uh, uh, th that kind of detail sort of accentuates what you do. What, what is the difference between before and after? And looking at those two components, yes, maybe the, you can argue that there's different light in that, there, but you can see the difference in the finish of the the different parts as you say the rose gold being mirror polished but basically and uh, the circular graining it's just it, plus the beveling all around it's just it it, 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 is, it is astonishing and uh, you know i know that we're actually hitting the one hour mark and i'm in two minds where to wrap up this and start a new broadcast to look at your other Big news, but uh, I think what I might do, I might edit, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll make two out of this anyway. So, um, so that look, that's been fascinating looking at this aspect of the uh, the restoration, and like so many other parts of this, Dan and John, we we could talk. 
forever about these uh, the, the different aspects of, of what you're doing there uh, because there's so many different parts as you should have to break that down I, I saw the the tray with the components in it and you know it, it's amazing the, the, how complex that whole well, process what's, what's is more yeah, amazing, I, I, think, I think I think everyone has to understand that John is so old that we he didn't have cameras way back when and yeah. he had to remember when he did this kind of work back then he, when you take all those parts away he was drawing little stick figures and keeping those notes very safe somewhere in the safe somewhere absolutely so he knew how to put it back hey, John, <laughs> now he has phones he can cheat when he's old <laughs> hey john i'm not old i just look at uh, hey, hey give them a cut the man the some boat, slack I, I look at these young watchmakers <laughs> with their phones clicking away and, as they're taking stuff apart because i'm wondering wait a minute this guy just came out of school like how's he doing a, a minute repeater like it's impossible it's totally impossible for our generation. <laughs> Absolutely impossible. And he's click, 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 click. <laughs> You're cheating, bro. You're cheating. It's the old days where you have sheets of paper because when you take something apart, uh, you know, you take notes. <laughs> uh, because, uh, for sure. Yeah. Right? I once got a minute for Peter in a, a bag, in, in, it was completely taken apart. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, miraculously, everything was there. I couldn't believe it, but uh, oh, really? uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, listen. Um, I one of the problems with this watch, uh, well, well two, first of all, I'd like to pay a particular tribute to the to the, the collector who's a very passionate collector. He made a big commitment to get that watch done. Like, for me, it's yeah. a month's work, for him, it's a lot of money, yeah. and uh, but he really wanted to, to get it right, and uh, uh, so you know. I tip my hat to the man because he's that watch is good for another 130 years, you know. Right. Like, uh, uh, um, it's a big commitment, amazing. Uh, amazing. But, um, uh, and secondly, it was an honor for me to work on a, a stunning piece. And uh, unfortunately, more and more pieces like that are making their way to me. And uh, I can't tell you what a joy they are to work on. They are, you know, like it's like peeling. A Fabergé onion, <laughs> you know, every layer you take off exposes another layer of beauty. So, yeah. anyway. Yeah, so I, what I wanted to say also is it, it gives uh, a lot of independence, such as myself. You'll even see a page on my website where I still uh, accept certain restorations, uh, it, something, but it would have to be something like John's doing, something that I, we passionately love because it breaks up the monotony of what I'm doing now. Oh, doesn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and for me, it's always about giving back the love. That was it's been my whole life, you know, with music and giving that love to someone else or saving them from a bad time in their life when my music touched them. Uh, they were gonna possibly commit even suicide. I've had many stories face to face with people that you know it it helped them. It it, it did something, and I I re always remember when I would get pieces like John's worked on, you know, crazy pieces. And even a basic pocket watches that they would come in and say, this was my grandfather's. This means everything to me. It might not even be uh, uh, too valuable uh, as, as far as top tier or anything like that, but it was valuable to that person. And when it was restored back to normal, when they brought it to 11 watchmakers who couldn't do this and they claimed this, that, and the other thing, and it sat in a safe, it could be for two generations. And you gave that back to them, like John has, has to give this watch back. Their face... They, they, all they want to do is jump on you and hug you like with a bear <laughs> hug, you know, they, you know, it as soon as they, they cry, I've seen them cry so many times and I'm, I'm not, it's like, I'm crying with them. I hope for the right reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you give them the bell. Oh, see what happens when I try to explain these loving experiences to these hard nosed men. <laughs> so you get a call from American uh, Express going, hey, yeah. are you sure here? <laughs> I'm trying to show but that if I can make a music, people, John, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> if I can make a music analogy as well, I think, um, I, you know, a, a dirty secret for watchmakers is we probably get so much more pleasure uh, uh, than the clients do because, you know, uh, I enjoy listening to music, but Dan, you got to make it and listen to it. So as a watchmaker, you know, we get to, we get into the watch. And I think that, uh, it's another level that we can appreciate the watch on that the guy who owns the watch is missing a little bit. And I think, uh, so the, taking the photographs of a work in progress, 
really helps share the enjoyment of of working on the watch you know? and you, you definitely convey that to today and uh, the complexities of what we do was seldom seen before it was always encapsulated never seen by anyone but us and that is the ple the pleasure that we got out of it why we do what we do now it because of social media we're, we're able to give more and more insight of the complexities of what people made you know in candlelight and, and manual yep. machines i mean it's 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 mind boggles us so it should certainly mind boggle you and and if you're a collector uh, we we welcome to show you inside your your timepieces you know that's that's the really cool part of technology today and uh, what john does is off the chart just so anyone understands here if you're still tuned in the work that john does and what he's working on this is not normal work you can't just come out of school and do this kind of stuff um john's you know he's a master the master of master of masters so you're seeing the top of the top of the top of the top of the top from the top tier dude uh <laughs> whatever he is in his i know how life. much yeah. i know how much you love that dude. john you <laughs> <laughs> that's you see okay for, for, for people who are watching here you know, we're using this term we're all laughing at the expression master here because uh i i did a little bit of work on uh, john's website um I use the expression John, uh, master. Johnny, you did all the work. What's above a master? <laughs> what can I what can I say above master? Oh, master's yeah. master? <laughs> <laughs> you can use your normal language clean, and God. make it sound more exotic. A maestro, you know. Uh, Godfather. But, yeah. like God, maybe, maybe that should be a godfather of watchmaking. Yeah, that, that might sound better. That's a little bit more, you know, cool, isn't it? But um, no, because people... Uh, I, I use the expression master watchmaker to describe you, Dan, to describe every one of the guests that we've had on so far on, in the medal, which has been amazing. The And the same for John. And I was working on, on his website, and John contacted me and says, hey, man, would you remove that uh, master <laughs> watchmaker thing there? You know, and I go, but that's how I see you, and that's how you know, your audience sees you and your, your customers. Your customers don't want to buy a masterpiece of a average watchmaker they want to buy a watch of a master watchmaker you know <laughs> so uh, so yeah no, that, that's I, actually you know john's way above i mean he's working on complications so he's the master oh, of the master of complications <laughs> well here <laughs> John, tell me this. You've been working I on see that someone has just put someone has just put in a post to kind of take me down a notch or two. So I'd like to say hello to Daniela Moran. Uh, 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 she was saying I look a lot more. <laughs> Hi, Daniela. Uh, it gets better. <laughs> The uh, Harry Potter of well, the Well, listen, we got, we got to get to John's new masterpiece. How, <laughs> how we do, how we sure. Do that. yeah, it, That's really it, what I wanted to talk about. I didn't really give a crap about what he's been doing for the last month. I want to know <laughs> about what he's doing now. <laughs> oh, my God. So, uh, yeah, I agree. We've, uh, we've maybe, uh, we, we should have run with this from the very top because this is a scoop. And this is the first time on In the Metal that we have actually had an exclusive news of a brand new piece of brand new brand it's irish and it's it's a very personal piece to john and uh, here i'm gonna shut up and let you have a look at it wow yeah. this is the ulan the hb1 and it is a triple calendar chronograph and i've been looking at this watch solidly for the last four or five days and um, it is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and in low light with the loom the that's loom, killer it's killer that's it's killer, killer dude <laughs> and uh, and w when we say that it is it has an uh, it, it's swiss and it is irish it has this beautiful famous and historic movement the value 88 and john has customized it you've broken that down to its component part and refinished every single component in that there and added the, that I, I just I, I love the bridge the that, that harp bridge which 
it, it, it makes it so I, I'm proud of it as an Irish man and it's so often you would find that people people make something that's Irish it's a little bit twee or it's a little bit kitsch this is serious hardcore beautiful workmanship all What's together twee and kitsch Twee is, you know, it's that sort of uh, Irishness. It's where you come over to uh, to curry or to cork, and you get, uh, you know, little Irish souvenirs that are uh, that are taken home. They're not really authentic Irish. They're sort of playing on a kind of historic uh, it's story. Kind of, it's kind of like the the leprechaun at the end of the rainbow type of precisely image, you know? i did not want to use those words but you're we, absolutely we like right who would want to be associated with that <laughs> no but like, hey i tell you what if you're a shop owner in killarney you want to be selling tons of that gear like you know but this is the absolute oh, yeah. antithesis of that sort of uh Full Irishness, gotcha. and uh, it, this is you know this show's called In the Metal. This is serious. Oh no, that's serious he metal. I mean, we all know that that thing's a battleship. We know you know people that know know. Um, but what John's done to it is just magnificent. That's it's wow, superb. And, I, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah. So uh, yes, so, let's uh, t give us a bit. Talk us through. Okay, um, I think it's apt that this follows up from the restoration I did because there's an awful lot of similarities between the work I did on the last watch. <laughs> Captain Forrest. Uh, <laughs> good man. But, um, uh, between the work I did in that watch uh, um, and the work I did on this, um, so it's an existing movement. Uh, uh, it's not a, a, a ground up uh, build like Dan is doing. It's not my design or anything like that. I, will, I had the good fortune of coming across uh, the value yes, a healthy stock, I don't want to say how many, um, of uh, the value 88, which is uh, of the family of chronographs as um, that the value 23, the 72, all of these really iconic movements that were used by many of the top Swiss bands and um, Patrick Philippe, Rolex, Vashi all used them. And uh, they now um, in auctions, they would come up from time to time, really insane prices. I was uh, fortunate enough to come across a stock of unused uh, stock from uh, of these. Uh, they had a, an average finish on it, and I, I knew immediately I wanted to strip them down to their component form, right down to the smallest component, refinish everything again. I've made some components, I've finished all components, um, all of the functions. It, it was a design that worked extremely well, but even on the they weren't, they were never ever properly polished or anything like that. Um, so I've managed to improve the function by polishing all of the functions, much the way we would have done the miniature repeater. And um, so I've applied the the crafts, the techniques that I would have employed on the more complicated watches that have been made for the past 20 years. And I've tried to distill it all into this watch. It's wrapped in a, a lovely, titanium case we try to work very very hard on the case and i want to talk a bit more about the case in a minute but um so it's a mixture of classical watchmaking in a, a contemporary case with a nod to the past and um i've never seen a value 88 it has a the triple calendar mechanism is on the dial side uh, i've never seen one with the with the movement exposed on the dial side uh, I think that's a first for an 88. And there was a, a lot of work refinishing all of those components as well. So, um, and we've, I, I've smoked the, um, the smoke sapphire insert underneath the printed section of the dial. And that um, gives a, a good background for the graphics. It improves the legibility of the watch. Uh, so, 
uh yeah that's it that's yeah. my, absolutely my big, beautiful big it's uh, extremely legible you you really did accomplish that mission big time big time are, are you, and it's, you um, uh, i don't know where you found these movements i don't know where the secret stash was but it's obviously a dream come true of people who who know no you know you you i mean they, look at the guy the guy with his rolex uh, that just wrote in before he's looking for a part for his Val 72 bro your parts in this watch <laughs> 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 these are hard to find so i don't know how john did it did you uh after you stripped these down john would is this is this nos or you have to do full restorations on all these sorry are the movements new old say stock? that again dan uh, were these movements that you acquired it's new old stock oh wow amazing amazing Amazing, it's yeah. new old stock, but uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've redone the building and all of the steel parts, all of the bridges. I've changed the shape of the bridges to have interior corners. I've made some components uh, where I wasn't happy with the finish, just to you know get a nicer function or a nicer finish. Um, all of the plates and uh, bridges are completely redecorated, and you can see it's it, it's hand finishing. Like the beveling is. Is all done by hand. Oh so no, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the steel. Yeah, I can, the steel can. work is uh, finished on uh, shellac stone, so you get a, a nice cleaner. Uh, um, the screws they're they're beveled and they're flat polished on tin block and everything like that. So it's yeah, they're, they're traditional techniques to bring this to this level. Was the rhodium uh, uh, plating still intact, or did you have to strip that down? On the plate, no, I stripped everything off, so it's gold plating on this one. And uh, but I, you know, I can do because it's built up completely, I can vary the finish. Uh, so you've uh, after uh, stripping them down, you're I actually do. all the main plates and bridges you've had to re rhodium plate them, absolutely. But every surface re is refinished, like uh. The, on the standard uh, 88, all of the bridges are rounded. They don't have any sharp interior corners or anything like that. So the bridges, the reprofiles, I have to file everything and uh, uh, machine some other part, machine some of the parts as well for them to fit nicely. And then it's every every component is hand finished uh, uh, to get you know, nice. Even beveling, absolutely with, beautiful. Polish. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think so, John, John, what you, I think, thank what you, you very much. What you should. Uh, also try to, what I'm trying to convey to people is just because we see these mechanisms uh, like this chronograph that we're looking at here, based, this is um, based on Ibosh e e e Valjoux 72 on this side, doesn't mean that the mechanism works perfectly from the factory even. Um, the standards, um, they sold. And it didn't. They, that's, that, that's what I'm trying, <laughs> trying to get this out, John, because people yeah. are just gonna think like he took a movement, popped it, yeah, yeah. And polished it up. So what I'm trying to explain to them is, uh, way back when, uh, companies like Valjoux would produce uh, different levels of Ibosh, just like Ita does today. So you can get low, low levels. So they would quickly, you know, either non-plated or plated, just really crappy, not decorated, no prolage, no anything, and quickly timed. And the hammers that you know run the chronograph, they're not <laughs> finely tuned. So it's kind of like getting a raw car engine, and you know, then you have to take it uh, to someone like John, who would be your Ferrari tuner completely disassemble the engine and you know what happens when you brought your you know your old car to someone like john you'd be cursing the whole way saying what kind of idiot worked on this and that's basically what we have and we're, we're basically start john starting over again making a brand new watch uh and and making it at its highest level of expertise timekeeping and of course uh the tradition of of what halagerie and where he you get you, in the end, you have to ask him where he got his shellac stone because that's the rarest stone that you know, <laughs> we hunt for. <laughs> if you don't know what um, that is, very true. <laughs> He's, yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to talk about the case and the overall design of the watch. Um, I worked with a, a, a very good friend and uh, an immensely talented man who is too modest to say it himself, uh, Graham Houghton. Uh, he has uh, two watches here in Ireland as well, uh, SAS watches and Melita watches. And uh, uh, he's just been a friend for, for a good many years now. 
And uh, when when I started with this uh, project, I I wanted him to do uh, 3D work for me because uh, uh, he's much better at it than I am uh, on CAD, and uh, and I mean much better. <laughs> and um, so I was trying to put ideas down and stuff like that. And then Graham came to the party with so many ideas and. Uh, uh, he really elevated this watch to what it is and uh, it was a, a great pleasure working with him on it and uh, he he blanches every time I call him a watch designer but look at this he clearly is yeah. you know uh, it's he's, he's done yeah, it's he's to this watch it's just yeah. nailed in every so, in every so way. it's it, the proportions everything is is I, just nailed yeah and no. there's a lot of work for there's a lot of to and fro in between the two of us on uh, you know trying to get the right tension because I wanted a watch that uh, really embraced the movement. I think an awful lot of modern watches have cases that are too heavy for the movement, and uh, but uh, it's also the case is forty millimeters in diameter, which uh, uh, for uh, a waterproof. I mean, it's only waterproof to three atmospheres, but as a modern watch, it has to be waterproof. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but to shrink that around uh, a movement of that size, that thickness, keep it within, within a reasonable thickness, and then an awful lot of work has gone into uh, you know on the sides of the case, the back of the case, to. Uh, Disguise any height that is inherent in the, because it's you know because it's a chronograph with a, a triple calendar mechanism. There's a good right. There's a good lump of a movement in there, but much like the watches um, from the 50s and 60s that used this movement, I always admired the proportions of the cases. Now they're not waterproof. They're, they have no water resistance whatsoever. Uh, whereas this is, and that takes up a certain amount of volume. So there's a lot of work went into the surfacing to uh, uh, satisfy those two criteria to achieve that classical look mm -hmm. or those classical portions while uh, within, uh, you keep the watch as small as that and um, uh, and not make it appear too tall as well, you know, so. Beautiful. Um, it really is. I, I think a lot another of, guy a lot of people such as my, even myself you know i'm a universal geneve uh, tricompax is my favorite timepiece but the yes. problem with wearing yeah. those vintage watches i mean i could you know i could obviously restore one if even if it was missing whatever parts it doesn't matter is there back then they were just dust proof and that don't work for me i mean at least i have to wash my hands on the sink i have to actually take my watch off and that's what people did back then it's what we what they did but being able to have mm -hmm. The beauty of yesteryear's movements uh, brought up to today's standards and beyond, you know, I mean, uh, um, uh, AHDI, you know, kind of standards uh, by John and wear it every day. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't cut down that, you know, 90 foot uh, waterproof. That's what as far as I'm concerned, that's waterproof. I don't understand why people don't get that when they read that on watches, on dress watches uh, of nowadays. You know, oh, it's not 330 feet deep waterproof. Well, you're not going 330 feet deep because if you did, you'd be dead anyway, bro. I, I used to take scuba diving. I know when you're gonna die. Okay, so 100 <laughs> feet. Where are you going? You know, don't wear it in the hot tub. I mean, you, you, that's kind of you really shouldn't. You know, it's yeah excessive heat. Uh, uh, with a watch like this as well, I, I would I wouldn't you know it really dissuade people from going for a swim with it. Like yeah. why would you go for yeah, a swim? Why with would you? Like yeah, uh, yeah. It, just because you can't. The, the reason why you rain, should. You know, yeah. and it's pouring rain. You it's live true. in a rainy kind of place like England or something like that. Um, you know, you have no worries. You're all set. You don't have to worry. Yeah. yeah. I, I worked in one of my my first job after Wall Step. I worked in Bermuda for for a year. And um, I worked in a Rolex after sir, you know, it, with a uh, a chain of stores that sold Rolex, that sold Piaget, Cartier watches like that. And um, uh, when I was at the beach at the weekend uh, in Bermuda, it's a small island. The speed limit, I think, is fifty kilometers an hour for the entire island. Uh, could be thirty kilometers. I can't remember. It's really slow. No one has a nice car. You know, they all drive Rex. Why would you have a nice car there? And, uh, it's immensely, you know, it's a very, very prosperous uh, 
uh, country. Mm-hmm. And uh, so people use their money to spend it on other stuff. So they, uh, they were really expensive jewelry. Like uh, walking down the street, everybody would have an Abel, which were the Rolex from the 90s, you know, like everybody mm-hmm. wore them there, uh, or a Rolex, Cartier, whatever. And um, the Rolex you wouldn't be too concerned about because they're very, very well designed when it comes to water resistance. But I'd be sitting on the beach uh, uh, during the weekend and you'd see people going by with diamond crusted Cartiers and Piaget's and stuff like that. Watches that, you know, you really, sh- you know, there's water resistance there to protect them in a shower of rain. You're not meant to swim with them. <laughs> you know, you're really not. Uh, I mean, Cartier would kind of say the same, you know. Mm-hmm. And you'd see this diamond encrusted watch on someone's wrist, and you kind of go, "Oh my god, I'm going to see that on Monday." Yeah, and true enough. <laughs> <laughs> Monday morning, you get a rake. Or, or uh, people are wondering so, uh, why they're yeah, getting the, a lot of value, uh, you know, eighty eights and seventy twos and so on and so forth around still. It's because people like John and I, we would get on our bench people who actually did that with these dustproof watches, and then we get water in it. They didn't want to bring it into the watchmaker, and they just put it away. And within 24 to 48 hours, it's, it's you know almost hermetically sealed, even though it was just dustproof watches. All that steel that you're seeing on John's movement, it just starts to pit and rust. I mean, really swiftly. A Rolex is even worse because it's very, Horribly, very yeah. much. Uh, it's within 24 hours. It's a it's a rust bucket, and it, got, it gets beyond the point where we can really repair it. Uh, if they let it sit for three, four, five years somewhere, then they bring right. it in. You know. And those the, the movements are gone. You know, the hairspring's rusted. Everything's rusted. And there's nothing we can do. So the watches back then were discarded, and we would tell them to go, you know, buy a battery watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're going to treat this like that, you don't deserve yeah. it. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. But here, we're, we're approaching the, the, the art. Another person. Right. You, I... you got to give John's yeah. new website uh, that you created there. Johnny, it, just so you know, again, Johnny's, yeah, well, no, it isn't Johnny's other amazing, yet, yeah. incredible thing that, that, that he gives to independent watchmakers behind the scenes besides amazing writing and showing the public, uh, the people that we are behind the scenes is uh, he make he made John a, an incredible website. Even though it's it's not complete, I know you'll say it's not complete. You it's, just it's threw it up. It's far from finished. It's far from and you finished. Can, and you can explain why you threw it up before we go. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'd just like to uh, like um, a, a big thank you to you, Johnny, for uh, the work you did on the website and uh, uh, all of the embarrassing things that I'm going to get you to change. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying how great I am. <laughs> but... Um, uh, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> listen, uh, jo- Johnny is a fantastic communicator. And yes. That is the reason why I went to that man to get this done. I could have gone to anyone. Uh, but I, I really want Johnny to do the work on the website because he gets it. He gets, you know, where I'm coming from. He gets the watch in and he knows how to. Uh, convey it in, you know, uh, in in such a, a clear and it's not just the clarity. You do it in the you you, you do it in the, your own poetic way as well, Johnny. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, well, it's an absolute pleasure. It really is. And, and I know that sorry, the reason why there's more to do it's because I have to give him more photographs. I didn't give him enough material, so don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, thank you. I, you thank know, you. I, I, well, another reason I started the show is, you know, he's such a blessing to all of us because things we can't get out, right, John? He somehow, he weaves between our thoughts and he can, like, get it onto paper somehow. I don't know how he does it, but it's, he's a blessing to the independent, all, all us independent watchmakers uh, to convey our message to, to those that will listen and uh and, and it comes from the heart guys it comes from the heart it comes from the heart you know i uh i i didn't get the chance to become uh to, to do what you guys did uh i i came to this too late in life to do it um I, th- there wasn't the opportunity as we, we talked about the swiss irish uh watchmaking institute it did not exist whenever i uh uh, re- discovered this amazing world and uh, so I didn't have an opportunity to do that but I, I do have an appreciation of how flipping painstaking it is to use wood and paste to get a mirror polish on a curved 
edge around a, 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 a movement plate yeah. and the amount of time that it takes to do that. And that's just one little aspect that so many people will look at a watch and they look at the back of it and go, that's beautiful. But that's that inspection takes 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And in each one of those watches that are handmade by you guys, like I, I, I get it. Now, you, you said the you used the expression that, I, that Johnny gets it. I do get it. And uh, I, I marvel at uh, that level of expertise, not even expertise, the dedication, the passion, because that is not something a lot of people would throw their hat at it very early on and say, to hell with this, you know, it's good enough. But not you guys. You keep pushing the parameters of what, what one would consider to be perfection. And I bet you, whenever you're finished, you still think, hmm. I could have, you know what I mean? So, um, look, thanks a million for the... Uh, Wait, give a shout out to, to the new website. What's, where is it? What is it? The, the new, it, right. Well, I, I think, John, that, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll try and describe it. Uh, the, the watch is called Ilan. Ilan is uh, Il, Irish. Ilan. Il, Il, so, if Il you know, uh, it's, re yeah, I have a bit of a uh, job of education with the, with the name because it's not pronounced the way it's written. It's per, it's written Olean, right? Uh, but yep. it's pronounced Ilon, as in I double L A W N, right? Ilon, if you're to spell it phonetically, right? Yes. Um, not difficult to pronounce, but you need to know. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, what's the dot com? Sorry, was there more, John? Johnny? Uh, it, yeah, it's. it's uh, no, that's it. It's www.ilon.watch. It's not .com. Mm. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a, 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 maybe, a new URL. Maybe uh, if you just put ilon.watch, it won't work. Just put the. Uh, oh, it should do. I think no. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So www. John, do you know how many how many you you'll be able to produce in this series? That was the question I was going to ask. Yeah. Good question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am not going, like, there will be, they are numbered pieces, uh, and I can't make more than uh, 10 a year because of the method, uh, you know, because of the way I make them, you know, they're very labor intensive. Right. So um, I'm not going to determine exactly how many pieces I'm going to make. I'd suffice to say, it's going to be a rare piece. Understood. And I'm also not going to fool around with the numbers. Like there will only be number one, number one, and it'll go chronologically from there. So if I make fifty or more pieces, it'll be fifty or more. You know, mm. uh, it worked for Philippe with his simplicity, and I don't see why you should have to do it any other way. I think this business of breaking down small batches of thirty or twenty or something like that is officially limited now so i'm i'm not i'm, I'm totally on board with that um, you know i think that's another part of making uh independent and independent we can write our own rules we don't need a sales pitch most of us are you know have backed up work for many years uh, when we create our own art this is not a watch everyone who's who is still listening uh john creates art uh this is your chance to uh not only get his art but something uh inside there that that everyone dreams to have a you know a vintage movement um, that's brought back to life at its highest highest form uh, by a master. Um, it, it can't last forever, and uh, if I was you, I would jump on it rather swiftly and visit his website, and you know a chance to also speak with directly with the watchmaker who mm -hmm. is the artist, and that's what independent watchmaking is about. That's what uh, this show is about: uh, getting inside the mind and the complexity of who these people are. We're all, you know, twisted. We all have OCD, but we all love what we do beyond love, yeah. passion. Yeah. Uh, when we finish something, we don't want to let it go, just like any other true artist. And that, sure. John is at the top, I, top, top. I know. I know Johnny's looking at the clock in the corner, yeah. so uh, I just like to finish by making Johnny squirm a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> we're going to call you the master communicator. Uh, how do you like that now? That guy's <laughs> wondering what the coming. hell took you so long, you know? <laughs> the master communicator. Yeah, I think I might get a t-shirt with that on it, you know? And <laughs> That's a good idea. 
<laughs> so, oh, well, uh, you can start oh. by trying to get your family to call you that. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, 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 that will work, man. I can tell you that will work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they really appreciate me. <laughs> Danny I'm Kitten, still flipping out that there's another mechanical somewhere in another country teaching watchmaking. Don't you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, okay, you you were right. I am looking at the clock here. I, I yeah. just I want to uh, look wrap wrap up here tonight and uh, say, look, thank you so much indeed for being game to come on and uh, be. As I said, like w w we're lucky to have the guests that we have, and uh, so for for you to come come on again as not only as a guest but as a friend of the show, John has been absolutely fantastic it's something that uh, dan and i both want a direction that we want to take it in so there's a little bit of variety uh, i have so much enjoyed talking about the 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 restorations tonight and uh uh-huh look at that bad boy uh, 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 the, <laughs> the great wheel Ooh, that's nice with the finish cool the great wheel great wheel offset great wheel. yeah it um, isn't, I don't have a center. It's called the Great Wheel because it's one of the biggest components right. in the watch. It's not that big. It's big. It looks beautiful. Amazing. I want to yeah, see it there's a, a post yeah. on Instagram now if anyone would want to see it. I think a, a little bit more clear. Uh, yeah, it's an offset. My my uh, my gear chain is offset from center. So it's all, it's going to be on the right side. Um, uh, and it looks better. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. Well, guys, it's, uh, it's been an absolute... Uh, Fantastic. I, I, I'm delighted with how it went tonight. Uh, I've loved looking at an aspect of watchmaking. And again, it just, it, it's, it's amazing. You could talk about it forever. It wouldn't bore us. It would probably bore our, our audience. So uh, we need to uh, come back and we'll talk about it again. John, uh, thanks a million. I wish you the very, I very... That, I, I think it could be worth uh, maybe some evening and with whoever you're working, working with going through maybe a small complication because the Jorgensen is a multi complication. You, well, you can't do any part of it adequate justice. So maybe a smaller part of a complication could be re, could could fill an evening. You know. Well, well what we're uh, talk, what, what I am thinking of doing, I think uh, Dan is agreement with me that we, we take maybe on, on the or most some evenings we're going to have guests and some evenings we're going to have yourself. Or a couple of or some other some of our friends, and we're going to look at a complication on its own, be it yep. the the chronograph, be it the, as we mentioned the other day when we were talking on the phone, the power reserve system, how how that little indication is put together, and it it looks like it's a a, a little minor detail. And none of these things are simple. Hey, even a three hands timepiece is. Uh, this is very little straightforward in from where I'm sitting looking at it. I can appreciate it. So uh, every part we'd like to go through. So the complications, and then we'd maybe like to go through the the finishings, the uh, techniques you, you, for decoration, guillotage or enamel or cross one enameling or uh, be it uh, the uh, every even applying loom. Things get there. How do you do this? That's what we want to know, and that's what in the metal is about. That we find out what these things. Later on, after uh, with through the pandemic and all that, you know, the, I think when me and Johnny set out to do this, uh, when we start to travel, obviously I'll have to travel a little bit with my timepiece. We want to infiltrate people's shops like yours, not bother them for too long, and do something just like you said, John. It's a great idea, uh, and we're listening to to people like you. Hey, uh, Graham. Yeah, so we'll infiltrate and we'll uh, we'll we'll steal some of your lifetime from an old man who doesn't have much left. <laughs> hey, enough, enough about me. Um, uh, so uh, <laughs> he's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, look, guys, we have uh, we, we, we've had a fantastic uh, episode again. This just keeps getting better and better and better. Uh, I am loving it. And uh, people who are watching, I hope you're loving it too, because it is, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's maybe a little bit longer than some other broadcasts. And uh, But we, we hope that you're enjoying it. And uh, to have the, somebody, the caliber of that 
average watchmaker, John McGonagall, and the master <laughs> watchmaker, <laughs> Dan Spitz. <laughs> that uh, that uh, it's an absolute treat to have uh, people, I guess, on board to be able to talk about this amazing subject. And uh, so, thank you, everyone, for watching. And for me, good night from Dan. Enjoy it. Uh, and we'll continue, and we'll just continue. See you guys. Thank you, John, so much for everything. As always, okay. you. thank you both of you. Okay, uh, we're at the top, bro. I, I, I love to kid around with you, but um, you know, I don't even know what to say. You know, your work is impeccable, amazing, beyond. Uh, people should be lining up for many, many years to get this new piece of yours for sure. For sure, we wish totally. you all the best. Absolutely, best of success with it. Thank, thank you, you everybody, for watching In the Metal. And uh, we will be back again next week. We have uh, another mad guest on next week, and uh, we have uh, the, the diary starting to fill up. So, uh, make sure you join us again, make a note of it, and uh, we'll do a few reminders during the week. And uh, thank you everyone for watching In the Metal, and we will catch you next time around. Bye. <laughs>